Um, I, I'm making this presentation at a time that might be considered a monumental point in the addiction field. You might say that uh, every point in the addiction, the history of addiction is monumental. It so happens that just recently, uh, they're not refle uh, reflected in the slides, the 2021 drug deaths figures came out as 107,000, by far the all-time record. At the same time, by some strange happenstance, although I'm easily impressed, last month was a series of presentations that, for me, had remarkable connotations for the state of the field and where we're going. Uh, Bruce, who has kindly joined us, presented the prior ATN webinar. He was positively cataclysmic. He talked about it. He almost had a kind of an apocalyptic scenario where he's concerned about the state of our whole world, which he links to the state of addiction. And he said he was going to be more forthright than he traditionally is in confronting all of this. The same day, I think, uh, Kasia Malinowska, Malinowska interviewed Carl Hart uh, about his book, Drug Use for Grownups, a whole new wave, I think, of thinking about addiction. And finally, earlier in the month, um, Smart Recovery sponsored a lecture by Nora Volkow uh, in a new series of lectures. She was the uh, pioneering, originating one in that lecture series. And people might think, isn't she the embodiment of the disease theory? And yet here she's appearing on a group of cognitive behavioral therapy counselors. I'm going to say things that are somewhat different than I think almost anybody in the world says. Maybe it's content, maybe it's style. And so just as a way of backup, I just want to quote a few people here. Uh, this is a cover of my memoir. It's been modified slightly since what you see here. Stan Peel is a true pioneer of addiction research and theories. His ideas must be reckoned with by anyone who is serious about understanding addiction, Maya Salovitz. Uh, on my cover, but not on what you see, you're my role model, Carl Hart said at one point. And Bruce said, I believe, when Love and Addiction came out in 1975, it opened my eyes completely. Derek, are you still there? Would you possibly read uh, Nick's quote about me before I get into the content? Can you read that? Stan, uh, I believe I believe it says that you've done much more than anyone to re reveal the inadequacy, inadequacies, absurdities, and injustices in the idea of what addiction, uh, that addiction is a disease, um, and that you have persuasively extended the critique to the you know, it, it, it's a glowing it's a glowing uh, review. When of, the disease of, theory of, of, is eventually replaced by more rational and humane approach in the popular understanding of addiction. Stanton Peel will be first in line to receive the plaudits, and those of us who broadly share his view will owe him a profound debt of gratitude. I don't we know if this... Have, uh, we should have asked Nick to read it out himself, actually. It's very difficult to see on the small screen in front of me, but uh, Nick can, is here as well. Can I just say that, that it's, it reads, Stanton Peel has done as much as anyone, not more than anyone. Well, well, I apologize. As I said, it's difficult to read. Well said. Um, I have a little quote here. Uh, sometimes I invoke negative responses, so I just thought I'd reference Bob Dylan. In 1965, when he appeared at the Newport Folk Festival, he introduced electronic music like a Rolling Stone, and he compared himself to other professional entertainers. By the way, I'm not comparing Carl Hart or Bruce Alexander to professional entertainers. Um, but for them, uh, getting booed at Newport would be a considerable jolt to their career. But to me, it was just one of those things. My life was like that. Booing didn't matter, you know, up and down. I, I identify with that quote. Um, my 
career and my ideas are not predicated so much on the approval of the responses I get. Um, they're predicated on something I'm searching for a deeper meaning, which is what I think Bruce was alluding to in his presentation. Um, I just want to touch back now also to love and addiction, which um, Derek might have been referring to. That was published in 1975, which is getting on close to 50 years ago. And I just want to point out the major points that I made then. Addiction isn't a characteristic of drugs. Addiction occurs with all powerful experiences. It's an interaction between a person, their life space, and their individual experience. It is crucially influenced by beliefs, individual and cultural. It is most impacted by cognitive life and environmental changes. And it is almost defined as being the opposite of what the disease model claims itself to be. I also might point out that in 1985, I published The Meaning of Addiction, which Ethan Nailman names as the book that most influenced his ideas about addiction. It was reviewed in the British Journal of Addiction by Griffith Edwards. Um, I wrote Diseasing of America in 1989. Mark Lewis says he read it cover to cover and it changed his whole approach. And in 1991, I wrote a self-help kind of book called The Truth About Addiction Recovery, out of which I developed an in, a rehab program, which is now online, and it's called the Life Process Program. Um, I don't know that anybody else who's likely to speak here has worked in the commercial treatment industry and presents a commercial treatment alternative, as I currently do. Um, and in 2022, we're at a point in history where addiction seems to be in play. Mark Lewis in Scientific America wrote, why the disease definition of addiction does more harm than good. Uh, Johan Hari, Maya Solovitz, Carl Hart, Sally Satel have had basically anti-disease bestsellers. And of course, assessing the brain disease model of addiction has come out. So it would seem as though this is my time, but it's not quite. I'm going to talk to you about how, as Derek said, I'm still really quite the outsider. And if there's, I want to just make a couple of fundamental points up front. I am saying that how we think about addiction is crucial in the manifestation and outcomes of addiction. That's a simple statement, but it's really a wildly radical theory. And I, I sometimes wonder whether virtually anybody believes that. I, I think perhaps Bruce believes that. Uh, and it's such a radical theory, and yet it's the fundamental presentation idea of Albert Bandura, uh, who perhaps the most famous 20th century so psychologist uh, who originated social learning theory and cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, I'm going to try and make these slides available for people as a way of following them. There's an awful lot of material. Uh, I'm kind of working on it with Derek. Uh, my version is the uh, uh, MacBook Air version. Anybody who wants can email me, stanton at peel.net, and I will send you my version of the slides, uh, which comes out of... Um, I'm not sure that everybody can process it. Um, it might have to be converted to PowerPoint. Um, my fundamental concept, drug use follows all the normal rules of human behavior. Addiction is an extension of ordinary behavior with which we are all familiar. Addiction can't be solved without addressing individual lives and society. Uh, I, I'd like to make a joke about this point. Um, I'm going to comment on all of the people whose names I've mentioned. Um, my, my, uh, 
uh, Bruce Alexander, Carl Hart, and his being interviewed by Kasia Malinowska. I'm even going to mention uh, Tom Horvath and Nora Folko. Uh, most of these people I know, not all of them. Um, and the two people who I feel I'm most closely attuned with are Bruce and Carl to some extent. Um, I'll, my joke is this, um, uh, a very biologically oriented um, um, harm reduction person, uh, Adi Jaffe, once said that I, Bruce Alexander and Carl Hart are radical environmentalists. And my joke is, he didn't mean that we blow up power plants. What he meant, I think, is that all of us, uh, Bruce has a model of addiction or of drug use, which he calls adaptive. And what he is saying by using that term is, it's the normal human process that people employ as a way of dealing with their life experience. And they may need assistance at various points to get through that. And drugs <laughs> are an adaptive part of that process. Carl doesn't really have, he's not a theoretically oriented person. Uh, his, his version, I call his version of addiction and drug use, um, the normalization version. It fits in the general model of all behavior. I have a model of use of drugs and of addiction based on the idea that drugs are one among many ways of producing powerful experiences. People react to those powerful experiences in terms of who they are and where they are in life. And it's possible that it can go overboard in a negative way. That is, it can become compulsive and detrimental, which constitutes addiction, but that that can often changed radically in a relatively short period of time. I'm talking about how people think differently about addiction in different places. I could call that addiction cultures. Um, unlike Nora Volko, I believe Bruce Alexander or Carl Hart, I'm a person who speaks as readily about alcohol as I do about drugs. Alcohol and drugs are part of one template in my mind. I don't know that anybody else does that. And I'm going to turn to alcohol because it's the most commonly used drug universally. And we know the most about how different cultures approach uh, alcohol. Um, and I also want to say the mindsets that develop around these substances comprise separate universes that are often incomprehensible going from one culture to another. The type, my title is, Is Addiction in the Eye of the Beholder? It's, people don't, aren't able to conceive of how other people see and experience substances, drugs and alcohol both, and what addiction means. They're disparate universes. Um, and alcohol is the most obvious example of that. Pat O'Hare is one member at one point, at least, of ATN. Uh, he said to me, he, he's a man who comes uh, from northern England. When he arrived in Italy, he lives there now. I've never seen a drunk person in Rome. What a monumental thing. To, it's the first thing he noticed. And yet, when you go to Oslo, the Norwegians are such wonderful people. The first thing you notice is how many openly intoxicated people you find. And on a weekend, walking through a park, you see people unconscious in the summer lying on the sidewalk. It's baffling. And yet, the International Society of Alcohol, a group that I'm not totally in favor with, I believe has made it their mission almost to deny what is the most obvious truth about, in the case of alcohol, the entirely different drinking cultures exist. Um, I actually debated one of the most prominent people in that group, Robin Room, in a piece in Addiction Research and 
theory, which is uh, is uh, AN, ATN's home journal, all of these differences in cultures at one point were regarded as almost like folk tales. They're not real. And then the European Comparative Alcohol Study was published making systematic national comparisons across European countries. It was called Alcohol in Post-War Europe. It found an inverse relation between national consumption levels and alcohol problems. Cultures that drank more alcohol had fewer problems. Now, one way that people used to deal with that is they said, well, possibly, but certainly not in some fundamental way. Uh, they had alcohol-related mortality that was the greatest difference of all. In North, Northern Europe, there were 18 deaths per 100,000 men and three for women by alcohol-related mortality. In Southern Europe, three deaths and 0.5 for women. That's a, that's a factorial of six. How could that possibly be? Do you believe that? Uh, there was one Italian commentator. Uh, Kettle Brun is a group of what is called temperance cultural members, which are Northern European and English speaking countries. The only keynote speaker in that group was uh, Alaman Alamani. In the Northern countries, alcohol is described as a psychotropic agent. It has to do with the issue of control and with its opposite, discontrol of trans or transgression. In the Southern countries, alcoholic beverages, mainly wine, are drunk for their taste and smell and are perceived as intimately related to food, thus an integral part of meals and family life. So that out, drinking is not connected to the topic of control or loss of control. There's a fundamentally different relationship, which anybody who's been to Italy recognizes, between how people think of and experience alcohol, and it's fundamental to the manifestations of alcoholism and even death according to that drug. The ECAS study divided nations into three groups. I, I mentioned Northern and Southern Europe. Um, there's a third group, Central Europe. Why did they do that? Why did they take the trouble to create three separate groups? Because they knew that there was greater consumption and fewer problems in Southern Europe. So they reconceive their theory. Their theory is the more you drink, the more alcoholism, the more alcohol problems. That's it. That's the, that's the story of addiction. Um, it so happened that European Union removed um, tariffs on alcohol throughout Europe. And so there was an influx of alcohol to Northern Europe, which a group read, led by Room studied he found that in Nordic countries, lowering taxes and easing restrictions on personal importation did not increase consumption. That a relatively large change in alcohol prices did not seem to produce a change in consumption is not something which the literature would have predicted. I'll translate that. Kettle Brun predicated itself and its policy and its understanding of alcoholism, though they don't talk about alcoholism, based purely on consumption. And yet some meaning of alcohol changed in Southern Europe by its unification with the rest of Europe. And problems due to alcohol, when, consum when prices were reduced and availability was increased, actually declined. Um, do you have time for one more radical mind-bending thing about alcohol? Do you? No. Who cross-cultural did a who? did a cross-cultural comparison of international classifications and research on alcohol dependence. Room, contrary to expectation. Whose expectation? Descriptions of physical dependence criteria appear to vary across sites as much as the more subjective symptoms of psychological dependence. Fundamental to Robin Room's thinking is, well, there's psychological dependence, and then there's real alcohol symptoms. Of course, they're not going to vary from country to country. 
my God, they did vary from country to country. I'm going to go way back in history now before I get off of alcohol. The very first research on the standard variables in alcohol were conducted by Don Cahalan and Robin Room back in the old alcohol research group. Um, they published Problem Drinking Among American Men in 1974. I'll give you five key findings. There was no one single organizing problem of alcohol problems. There wasn't like alcoholism, loss of control, and other things circled around that. Problems varied in different directions. There were rapid changes for the same individuals over a period of only four years. There were deep cultural differences embedded in people's drinking habits so that Jewish and Italian drinkers were way at the bottom of the drinking problems list. The greatest determinant of drinking problems was who you drank with. I want to take a little back step now and say, I guess one of the greatest accusations that could be made against me is that everything I say is like common sense. Cahill and Arun found that the people that you tended to drink with were the biggest determinant of drinking problems. In the same way that Room decades later said, well, we don't expect physiological symptoms to vary from culture to culture. In fact, when they did correlations across the various types of problems, the dependence and withdrawal had their highest correlation with psychological dependence. So if Robin Room had paid attention to his own research in 74, he wouldn't have been stunned to find that what he calls physiological symptoms varied as much from culture to culture as psychological ones. I want to jump right now back to drugs. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what Bruce meant by thinking that we're in the most dire possible straits around addiction, but it's on people's minds. And it, life and death in America, it, and, and Bruce said, like, he thinks that all of the crucial factors in what may be the destruction of our culture trace back to addiction. I agree with that. Um, the Global Burden of Disease was published in 2017. Uh, it measured 196 countries, something called disability adjusted life years, which is a combination of how many life years in terms of death and in terms of disability that each country, 196 countries experienced due to a number of things. The United States, was first in the world in dailies lost, disability adjusted life years lost to cocaine, second in amphetamines, and third in opioids. How is that possible? There are countries that are barely holding themselves together. And we're number two overall in all drug disability adjusted life years lost to drugs. How's that possible? I just want to go through a history of how in America we've responded to these things. Um, Nora Volko in 2011 was, she really became famous then. They did a first front cover story, a general in the drug war. She must say it a dozen times a day addiction is all about the dopamine. Do you think Nora Volko would say that today? Nature in 2014, which is, this is the th article that organized Addiction Theory Network. Volko has the scientific clarity of vision and the relentless patience to be able to argue for the promise of research effectively. And in Europe, politicians too frequently ignore it. You stupid Europeans. In, 19, in 2015, Nora wrote, has a blog, Addiction is a disease of free will. Um, the White House website uh, under Obama, the groundbreaking discoveries about the brain have revolutionized our understanding of drug addiction, enabling us to respond effectively to the problem. And then there's a video of Nora Volko on the homepage of the White House under 
Barack Obama. Nature in 2020 says Nora Volko leads the world's biggest funder of addiction research at a time when the United States is grappling with the dis- devastating surge in drug use. Is Nature having second thoughts about heralding Nora Volko as a leader of the free world? I'm only going to give one graphic <clears throat> about drug problems and death. This is drug deaths in the United States. Um, I do it because I I want to break it down. Obviously, the thing we're most concerned about are synthetic opioids. Uh, But take a look on the right. Drug deaths have shot up for heroin, methamphetamines, and cocaine as well. And for some crazy reason, they don't have benzodiazepines on the graph. Benzodiazepine deaths have gone up. in the course of May, since I made these overheads, the drug deaths for 2021 have now been revealed 107,000. I happen to know uh, in great moments in addiction history, in 1997, uh, um, Alan Leshner wrote, uh, addiction is a disease of the brain and it matters. In 1997, there were 9,000 drug deaths in America. They've increased tenfold between 1990 and 2000. When the Drug Policy Alliance was created, there were 17,000 deaths. There's been 500% increase since then. In 2003, when Nora Volko came into office, there were 27,000 drug deaths. So they've quadrupled since then. That interview in 2011, where she was announcing the first awareness of painkiller deaths, where she's talking about how we can definitely deal with them, there were about 40,000 drug deaths. So since then, they've increased by two and a half percent, to 150 percent. I'm going to go back to the global burden uh, study. There's certain things that have occurred that are just beyond belief to me. I'm easily amazed. The U.S. dailies that I described work out to be 1,700 per 100K population. In Europe, that figure is 340 per 100K. Europe, U.S. has exactly five times as much disability-adjusted life years lost as Europe, as taken as a whole. How's that possible? Isn't Europe essentially like America in most demographics? But that's not the most amazing thing. Before these data came out, the leading scientific journal in Europe, Nature, was saying, you stupid Europeans. Why aren't you following Nora Volko's lead? If I would have had a chance to talk to the editors of Nature, I would have said the very way that we conceive and think of addiction is causing a multiple series of deaths. They would look at me and say, what are you talking about? We're scientists. They're doing scientific research. And here's the more amazing thing. Um, I got these data, if you can look it up on the internet, from the 2019 World Happiness Report, which is written by quite a brilliant economist named Jeffrey Sachs. Um, He reviewed, and he's quite politically oriented, these data. And what was the number one theory? He said, well, what's explaining all of this? The number one theory he proposed was the opponent process model of addiction. For those who don't know it, the opponent process model of addiction is sort of like Nora Volko's model without the frills. It says that if you take any drug, there's an instantaneous reverberation in the opposite direction, which would be withdrawal, and so you can't stop taking the drug. In Love and Addiction, I discussed this with Archie Brodsky at length, that explains nothing. Uh, He used it to explain sex and love addiction as well, 
by that model, there would be no difference between any human being or any culture who experiences any drug or any powerful experience. They would all have exactly the same unit. The, the great thing about the opponent process model is it's totally invariable according to any other variable, any human variable. And Jeffrey Sachs thinks that why America is five times as likely, Americans are five times as likely to die or to suffer disability as Europe is due to that model? That explains it? I want to go back to that graphic. Deaths cover all drugs, including benzo, increase in deaths include all drugs. The acceleration began before the pandemic. Now, if I were to ask, any human being, and I do this at every presentation I make, why did drug deaths start to leap up in 2012? Everybody knows the answer to that. Everybody. Because drug companies started promoting painkillers. There's been a steady decline in painkiller prescription in the United States from 2013 to 2021, 2012 to 2021. They're now 40% below their peak period. And in that same period, drug deaths have increased by 250%. The most basic scientific analysis tells you that that explanation makes no sense. But everybody, that's everybody's explanation. I'm going to get more into uh, medicine for opiate use disorder. People complain constantly in the United States, harm reduction people. Uh, well, we're not doing enough. Of medication, buprenorphine, for people. That's why deaths are increasing. And statistics are presented. There are over 40% of counties in the United States who do not have active buprenorphine programs. You mean to say that more than half of America is covered by, by drug addiction? pharmaceuticals, they are now a major product of the drug industry. So all the fundamental explanations, all the variables that we're looking to explain a radical increase of drug, drug deaths have gone in the proper direction and yet drug deaths are, why are drug deaths still increasing and increasing? Why? We have no answer for that. I want to, I'm making the point that how we think about addiction uh, influences addiction. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, there were a series of experiments. Nick, I'm just about to give you, bow my cap to you, that looked into how people's conceptions influenced uh, their likelihood of uh, responses to alcohol and treatment. Nick Heather and Steve Ronick wrote Cultural Delusions of Alcoholics. Believers in a one drink, one drunk syndrome were less likely to become controlled drinkers. They published something in 83. Relapse following treatment is better predicted by the subjective measure of dependence than the objective measure. Jim Orford compared the same thing, objective measures of dependence and subjective measures and found that subjective measures were better in predicting treatment outcomes. And Bill Miller did a famous study where the belief in the disease theory of alcoholism predicted relapse after treatment. This type of study is no longer very apparent in America and anywhere. So the most radical study ever conducted of the impact of conceptions of addiction and drugs was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association by Charles O'Brien, who is the epitome of the disease model of addiction. Um, now, Trexone is a drug that is supposed to affect the very uptake of the neurochemicals and the experiential brain effects of alcohol. It's never been, and opioids, it's never reliably predicted outcomes. So they came up with the conclusion that genetic matching was what was required. Some groups had the proper genetic makeup that they would experience naltrexone's effects. 
And so they divided the population of alcohol dependent subjects into those who had that allele and those who didn't. They double blinded the experiment with placebo versus naltrexone, and they used 12 measures how quickly to first drink, total relapse, most alcohol consumed during um, uh, drinking sessions. There was not a significant difference in either the main factor, naltrexone versus placebo, or in any interaction. They should have won the Nobel Prize. They showed that if the provider and the participant believed that a substance would allow them to drink in a reduced fashion, they would drink in a reduced fashion whether or not they actually got the substance. What a stunning finding. Their conclusion, despite the results of this trial, pharmacogenetics continues to hold promise as a way to improve the targeting of medications. They missed their own Nobel Prize winning discovery. We've got to go back and do this study with different genes. Uh, Project Match spent $41 million to produce nothing. There is no practice now saying, well, certain alcoholics with certain characteristics are more likely to respond to certain kinds of treatment. Um, they found overall the treatment is highly effective, uh, measured by 25, a reduction in shrinking days over the whole population from 25 to six days. Robert Cutler did an analysis and attribute 3% of the outcomes to treatment. And virtually all of the reduction in drinking, just as it did in the O'Brien study, occurred between the first and second sessions of treatment. We come in a highly socialized group, no prison records, socially stable. Oh, you have to reduce your drinking or quit. Um, by the second session, the majority of the population by far had done that. Nora Volko defines the American disease context. Forget all this crazy research I'm talking about. Forget 107,000, rounded up to 108,000. That doesn't matter. And this is the disease, this is the American context. Why is there no discussion of NIDA's failures? Volko, how is Volko immortal? She was selected by George W. Bush. No president is going to remove uh, Nora Volko. But Nora Volko has been dancing as fast as she can lately. Her talks have developed some very odd things. Um, but fundamentally, she's all about the disease. I wrote a modestly titled piece you can look up, why we need to stop Nora Volko from taking over the world as presented by the fact that they have, we have five times this, the dailies of Europe. So um, I'm gonna be talking about a group of people who in many ways I owe my life to, not my career. I don't know if I'm gonna get a chance. I don't want Nick, uh, Heather blubbering. Nick Heather's almost saved my life with the book Control Drinking. Uh, Bruce Alexander's Rat Park did likewise. Um, Ethan Nadelman is somebody who held out options for me when I got banned totally from the alcoholism field. And Tom Horvath has been, you know, one of my greatest supporters throughout my career. Um, why did Tom Horvath have Nora Volko come to speak in this incipient, in this inaugural lecture? Because it's good for SMART to be backed by the head of the NIDA. <clears throat> and he introduced her by saying, she now sees that recovery is defined in terms of functionality and not abstinence, which is true. She says that. Um, and she also, in her presentation, talked about how important support was for community support. But the first two topics she discussed were how trauma impacts lifelong susceptibility to addiction. Nora Volko has perceived that the trauma model allows her to expand the reach of the disease model. 
And then she starts fantasizing. It was as though she was on a drug. How we're going to develop drugs that interrupt the experience, neurochemical effects of addictive drugs. That's what naltrexone was supposed to do. That's what it's claimed to do. So she hasn't really changed at all. What Volko didn't say to Smart is most users, which she says elsewhere, most users don't become addicted. Non-drug addictions, what are those? In that 2011 article, she wrote uh, in, a, uh, in the Times, only a minority of novices will develop the compulsion to keep taking drugs. And from heroin and cocaine to sex and lies, Tetris and ponies, the spectrum of human addiction is vast. But she, if you had Nora Volko to talk to, what kind of questions would you ask her? She didn't discuss the no normal drug use. You know, it's called the National Institute on Drug Abuse. What about Bruce's bottle of adaptive drug use? What about Carl Hart's normalization of drug use? What about drug legalization? What about drug consumption sites? None of those were brought up. And so, you know, Tom Horvath, I'm actually on the International Advisory Board of SMART, and Tom showed me the great respect of asking me what I thought of the presentation. And I said, Tom, I know why you're doing this. If Nora Volko feels it's good or necessary to go out and say, look, SMART's okay, you have to accept that. She hasn't changed her fundamental approach. Back to the disease model in the Times. Drugs fundamentally alter the brain's workings. Even after addicts are successfully detoxed, their dopamine circuits remain abnormally blunted. She'll never give up the disease model. Dr. Volko's confidence in the success of these measures is unshakable. Unshakable. In 2011, 250% increase in drug deaths later, she's talking to smart recovery with that unshakable confidence. The American cultural mindset about addiction has been, and I actually learned this originally from uh, Nick's unbelievable book, Control Drinking. He included in it his, his history of temperance. <clears throat> AA in the 12 steps goes out of the temperance movement and it's embedded in American culture. Um, chronic brain disease came upon that after AA had already laid the fields for it. MAT and medicine assisted treatment, MOUD, are now applied. They're the most popular drug policy reform technique. And the most popular model for thinking about and treating addiction now, psychosocial model, approaching the growing chronic brain disease model is the trauma model. Let me say something. Um, um, assessing the brain disease model of addiction. I personally never use the term brain disease model of addiction, never. Why don't I? And why do they? I use one word, disease. I have a little theory that Nick and the writers were finally free to tackle the disease model by calling it the brain disease model of addiction. Because what Nick learned, I first met Nick when he came to America in between the hardened paperback version of controlled drinking when the Pendry et al. So Bell's monumental backlash occurred. And if Nick learned one thing there, besides what Hanukkah prayers are like, he came over Hanukkah, it's that you'll be scalded to death in America if you tackle AA and its basic premises. So my modest theory is Nick's group, ATN, had to wait until AA and the 12 steps were no longer the prototype of the disease model in order to attack the disease model. Just my modest theory. <clears throat>
Why, what were they afraid of? There's a slot in America's head for addiction as a disease. Um, so I'm kind of saying that assessing BDMA doesn't know what the disease theory is or can't state what it is. An addictive disease is a baked in irreversible lifelong loss of control from using a substance. AA said that, alcohol is a chronic relapsing disease. Volko added on to it, it's a chronic relapsing brain disease. Is this a scientific statement? It's not. It's a cultural slot in American thinking. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into, uh, Nora Volko never discusses alcohol. Never. You can, I hope you can get a hold of this slide. In 2015, in her uh, Nora, uh, NID archives, Advancing Addiction Science, her title is Addiction is a Disease of Free Will. Have I told you that I'm often stunned by things that everybody else takes for granted? America's leading scientific agency dealing with drugs proposes that addiction is a disease of free will. <clears throat> um, I had a little set to uh, with uh, Nick. I critiqued some of what, well, starting with the title, as you might have noticed, some aspects of assessing the brain disease model. And then I said, you included trauma theory in a book about changing the disease model. The trauma model is a disease model updated. The trauma model is, and, and uh, Gabor uses diseases all the time. He uses laws of control in his talks. Um, the, disease, the trauma model says you acquire um, an inability to control your drug use. And it's lifelong. Um, the ubiquity of the trauma model, it, it's as big as the brain model in America. Uh, this is a quote from Paolo Segal. The reliance in books and on television and stories that define characters by their pain, their guilt, the weight of their suffering. Trauma narratives are limited by their need to portray what trauma does. Anil annihilate the self, freeze the imagination, force stasis and repetition. Trauma theory pervades America, and it's a theory of being unable to change. Um, in America, we have one response to increasing drug deaths, one response only, more treatment. Everybody knows we need more treatment. Everybody knows that. Um, uh, in 1985, I wrote what treatment for addiction can do and what it can't, what treatment for addiction should do and what it shouldn't. Um, I disagree with, uh, in America, in the 1980s, uh, addiction treatment exploded. Private treatment, the Betty Ford Center exploded. In the 1990s, that became government policy. The United States changed from investing in education, health, in many ways, housing and can consciously switch the money spent to treating. America is a society predicated on treating addiction as a disease. It's, that's its very basis. I just wanna do one more slide. Um, I publish regularly uh, in a popular um, harm reduction periodical. And for the first time in my life of working with this editor, um, he accepted something for publication and then he said, I can't publish it. Uh, there are fundamentally different ways of thinking about drugs. Um, they're warring visions. The temperance vision is that alcohol and drugs are evil and can't be controlled. The medical and public health, and that leads to the drug war. 
the medical and public health model, which is assessing the brain disease model, is essentially anchored in, says that drugs are essentially unhealthy and they spur a disease. It's a negative view. And along comes Carl Hart, normal and purposeful behavior, and, and Bruce and me, like uh, drug use is one of a class of behaviors, like any other behavior, that can be pursued in a normal way or an abnormal way. That view isn't reflected. Carl Hart didn't participate in assessing the brain disease. That view isn't reflected in assessing. Uh, I, uh, Nick wrote me that he believes it. So I want to just go to my last presentation, monumental presentation. Kasia, Kasia Malinowski interviewed Carl Hart and I knew what would happen. There would be a there would be an opposite vision of drugs clashing. Kasia began by describing a person at a festival who she knew was on drugs, and he was a perfectly nice and normal person. That's sort of like people saying, "Oh, I'm not prejudiced. Kasia's not a prejudiced person in the least." That's like, "Oh, I know a person who is a, and he's really nice." But Kasia is Kasia is prejudice against drug users and drug use. Um, there was no discussion of why people Carl use, like why do you enjoy drugs? She instantly switched to the negatives of drug use and addiction and Carl apologized. He said, well, I've put down harm reduction. Uh, Carl and I both wrote pieces for that publication called Beyond Harm Reduction. Um, where Carl describes, well, I use drugs and it doesn't hurt me. And Kasha's reaction is, yes, but you're a special person. You're well educated, blah, blah, blah. She's explaining why drug use is a negative experience for virtually everybody, just not him. And if she really wanted to explore how drug use can be normalized, or positive, what would she have done? She would have said to Carl, can you describe your drug use and why you find it beneficial? Or she might have looked into her own experience. I don't know, Kasha. Um, I assume she drinks alcohol. She certainly knows people who drink alcohol. And she might have said, well, most 80 to 90% people, going back to the alcohol research, who would drink, enjoy the experience. What's that about? How is that possible to integrate drinking into a positive life cycle? That is not part of assessing the brain disease model. It's a, uh, I don't know what the answer that um, Bruce suggested that we're going down the tubes in addiction. Um, I don't know where we'll be able to remedy it, but we have to get to the next phase in relating to drugs. We can't relate to drugs as an enemy any longer. Uh, what is harm reduction? Nora Volko actually focuses now on life functioning rather than abstinence. The ideas that I'm presenting have been endorsed by a government agency about 10 years ago, SAMHSA. Recovery is a process of change whereby individuals work to improve their own health and wellness and to live a meaningful life in a community of their choice while striving to achieve their full potential. Huh. And they have four pillars, recovery pillars, health, home, purpose, and community. And Nora Volko has been backing up as fast as she can. Whenever I ask people on the front lines of America's drug crisis what more we can do to support and help their work, they remind me how essential it is to address the basic needs of individuals with addiction, such as a stable and safe housing, food, basic medical care, and opportunity for employment. Well, what about um, dopamine? Isn't addiction all about the dopamine? But in the 2018 disease director's blog, uh, 
Some critics also point out correctly that a significant percentage of people who do develop addictions eventually recover without medical treatment. She's backing up to the data. It may take years or decades, may arise from simply aging out of a disorder that began during use or may result from any number of life changes. God, wouldn't it be nice to think about what those life changes are? Uh, Gene Heyman put, has reviewed those variables. Put in more personal terms, addicts often say they quit drugs because they wanted to be a better parent, make their own parents proud of them, and not further embarrass their families. Uh, Derek, my approach I would call to addiction ex existential approach. Drug coercion is a major factor. It's the major factor. People don't volunteer to go to drug treatment. So there's just one little other thing. I'm not in um, assessing the brain disease model of addiction. The largest segment of people uh, in there, this is my last comment before a summarizing slide. Uh, uh, there was a trial in America. A woman named Joyce El J J Eldred was under probation for robbery. She uh, tested positive for fentanyl. They put her in jail and they accepted briefs, amicus curiae. One that was authored by four people who contributed to assessing the brain disease model you would, now, a priori, if addiction is a disease of the free will, you would think that Nora Volko would be the one who would say, well, they can't make judgments, we'll force them into treatment. The non-diseased people were the people that wrote the brief saying that people should be forced into treatment, should be jailed and forced into treatment, including four authors that appeared in assessing. And in that brief, they actually wrote that being forced into treatment is one of the good ways in which jail is helpful. By the way, if you're forced into jail and into treatment in the United States, what's going to happen to you? What kind of treatment do you think you're going to get? Eldred, Julie Eldred, was granted probation. This is before she relapsed. She began an intensive all-day outpatient treatment program and she started daily doses of Suboxone, a medication that can quell opiate cravings. And then she relapsed. So a major, the major cohort of contributors to assessing the brain disease model stand four square behind jailing people as a way of forcing them into treatment. Um, I have a value statement that I'll make. And I don't know that assessing the brain disease model of addiction reflects my values. Um, my goal is that we can and should enhance and preserve life. I put a value on rationality and reason. I respect empirical findings. I view people as self-regulating. To me, it's a sin to tell people, oh, you can't, you don't have free will. Why would you tell anybody that? And to put them in jail in order to get them to perfect themselves. And that it's fundamental to me, the human freedom of choice. And underlying that's something I think Bruce might endorse, is society striving for equality and community. So let me just answer the one question. Why? Have drug deaths quadrupled since Nora Volko and increased by became head of the NID? Why have they increased tenfold since addiction is a, br a brain disease that matters? Because not only is Nora Volko and 12 steps and the trauma model, but even in large ways. Um, the drug policy reform movement, which is now invested completely in the MOUD movement because they're convincing people that they don't have the ability 
or the resources to change their behavior. I wrote in Filter on coerced treatment, it's important to establish that forced treatment is always wrong. It is a tool for controlling people that tramples human rights by ignoring the individual's own values and preferences. And it is ineffective since it eliminates the most essential element in genuine recovery. Remember the four pillars approach from SAMHSA? It says the most important underlying ingredient, it's the same thing that uh, Bill Miller emphasizes in motivational enhancement. It's people's feeling that they're in control of their own life and that they're the people moving their lives forward. If you undercut that, which all of the main theories and approaches to addiction do in the United States, you'll get increased drug addiction and deaths. It's as logical as night versus day. So in many ways, I am more of an outsider, Derek, today than I ever was. Uh, the guy were, who used to publish all my things in the drug policy reform harm reduction journal feels I'm too dangerous to touch. You may have noticed that I'm not one of the contributors to assessing the brain disease model of addiction. How could I be? I might say something about some of the other participants. The forced treatment or the, that's, you can't have that. Politeness must be a start. And I, you know, I sometimes feel you can be too blunt and confrontational. The effective treatment and policy of addiction in a world worth living in. It addresses human beings' real needs. It's community-based. It comes internally from the environments in which they live. It never attacks a person's power to change themselves. And it creates healthy, self-sustaining people within that community. God, are we gonna do that anytime soon? There's reason to be pessimistic about that. But unfortunately, that's the only resolution for addiction. All right. I've blathered on longer than I should have, Derek. As I said, uh, I, I will, if you write to me, Stanton at Peel.net, I'll endeavor to send you these slides. But the backup for all of these things that I've been saying comes from my memoir. Um, a scientific life on the edge. Thanks very much, Stanton. Uh, before I open the floor uh, to questions and discussion points, I just want to put on record that addiction research and theory, the journal is independent of the Addiction Theory Network. But over to anyone who has any questions, I imagine Nick, you might want to come in. Nick, are you on mute? No, I'm, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, I did want to say something. I, I was hoping it would be closer to the end as a kind of, uh, you know, general uh, summing up kind of uh, comment other, uh, after other people. But since you put me on the spot, um, I will say something. Uh, I, if you got a chance to uh, look at the words that I that I used in uh, Stanton's memoir, which by the way, I highly recommend that you, you should buy. It's, Thank you. It's a great read. If, if you look at the words in my blurb, um, um, you know, uh, I would stand by every one of them uh, and uh, they express exactly what, what I think about uh, Stanton's contribution uh, uh, to the field. Um, now, our book, Evaluating, by the way, Stanton, not assessing, evaluating the brain disease model of addiction. I mean, there are reasons why Stanton wasn't wasn't included um, to do with the fact he was invited. He was invited to join the Addiction Theory Network, but he declined and, uh, and so on. I, I tell you this, I'll say this quite simply. I think it was a mistake for us not to include a chapter by him. He, he should have been invited. Uh, the book would have been much better had he been invited. Well, thank your heart. Um, now, uh, I, but I think one 
small amount of criticism is Stathard's belief that, that, that he's the only one to think many of the things he thinks. Um, uh, you know, first of all, I think that's particularly in the United States context that he's such an outsider. Um, and I agree with him that uh, if you read his memoir, you, you know, I think you can reach no other conclusion than that, that, that he is an outsider in the addictions field. But I think that's a particularly in the USA context. I think if uh, dear old Santa lived in the UK, he would have a much uh, warmer reception. Um, and um, I, I mean, I the point is that, that most of the things he said, uh, I agree with. And, and, and most people, uh, so most people that I know, certainly most people in the addiction theory network agree. Not all, not everything. You know, there are some things that I think Stanton is wrong about, but I agree with most. He, and he's not the only person to think these things. There are a great ma many of us who, who would support him. And I think sometimes it would it would be helpful if Stanton would recognize that that there are many of us who believe, for example, that the the the, the way addiction manifests itself in society uh, is largely or largely determined by people's expectations and what people think about it. For example, I mean, I've been I I I, I, be, I believe that for forty or fifty years. Um, so he's not the only one to think those things, but we have learned a lot from Stanton. Um, I've I've learned a lot from his books, and if anybody hasn't read his books, I do recommend them to you. The ones that he's uh, that he's uh, spoken about today, and I think he's done a tremendous service to the field. That's that's all I want to say, really. Thank you. That was since that wasn't a question, Stanton. I won't give you the right to respond, but I'm going to go straight to Bruce Alexander, just in the interest of saving time. I do just want to say one thing. I am an outsider. I'm not, I've never been allowed to speak before the Open Society Foundations, never. Um, Maya. Oh, me. Ka Ka Kasia Malinowski would never invite me. I've never been excited to speak by NIDA and I'm being crowded out by harm reduction places. And I have mentioned not being in your book, but it would be a little ungrateful for me to appear in an international hookup on the ATN platform and not to doff my cap to you and to say, however much I disagree with some things in your book, um, bless your hearts for giving me this forum and support for expressing my views. Um, it's a, and it's a matter of quite strong intellectual integrity that you should do so, given that I'm making some claims against what you presented. Bless your hearts. Bruce, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, Stanton, I, I'm thanking you for um, keeping me spellbound as usual. I, I really enjoyed this talk and there's a lot in it. I, I wanna focus in my question on this, your, the explanation for the explosion of drug use, drug addiction and overdose deaths in the United States in the past few years. And you've you've listed, you've tried to explain that. And, and ultimately, I think you're explaining it by saying that, that well, it's because the United States looks at addiction in such a, a strange way. So, so I wanna pose two little questions about that. Would you say a little more about why the United States looks at addiction in such a strange way? Because I, I mean, why why would it? And and would you say a little bit about Case and Deaton's idea, which I know you know about about deaths of despair, because they have proposed they have proposed an explanation. Thanks, for Susan. What, By the yeah. way, I um, in the early nineteen eighties, I published something called Through Glass Darkly, where. Uh, Maltzman and Penry had attacked the research by the Sobels. The Sobels research was harm reduction research. Their fundamental finding was that people who were taught what was called controlled drinking then, 
which we would now call harm reduction, were more likely not to let that blow up into a full-blown relapse. They had eight times as few, the uh, disease model people, abstinence people had eight times as many incidents of alcoholism, uh, of uh, uh, alcoholic days. I published that article in Psychology Day after it had been taken over by the American Psychological Association. And my career dead ended for 10 or 12 years. <laughs> Just in that period of time, Nick Heather visited. I had read Control Drinking. And Nick Heather visited. And I, well, I can't say they saved my career because my career hasn't been saved. But Nick Heather kind of saved my life. Um, to read all about control. And in his introduction, Nick Heather, I'm paraphrasing, I don't have the book in front of me, said he regrets the tendency for people to reserve the controlled drinking practices for only non-alcohol dependent people. What a radical, the leading purveyors of control drinking in America, Marla and Miller had both withdrawn to the point of saying, well, they're not real alcoholics, they're controlled drinkers. Um, Nick wrote about temperance. It's hard to believe in a book by a clinical psychologist, I learned first about the impact of America's culture. Uh, Nick wrote about in the 19th century, uh, we had, you may be aware that America had prohibition between 1920 and 1933. Uh, perhaps you're aware that they've never had national prohibition in Italy, Greece, France, or Spain, and that nobody's proposed national prohibition. Stan, can I just uh, nudge you towards answering the questions, please, a little bit? And so uh, America has had bred into it an attitude, and what Nick pointed out is that temperance was the, uh, was the disease model applied to alcohol as a drug. AA came up with it brilliant conception of applying the temperance model only to inbred alcoholics. The, the, the attitude towards alcohol, and then ironically, drugs were subsumed into the temperance model only belatedly. The drug or the alcohol is the source of the problem. I mean, of course, Carl's famous quote is, drugs are not the problem. Um, you likewise take that position. It's an essential component in American thinking that isn't remedied by data on the one hand, like the data that placebo is as good as a drug in reducing drinking. And it's not reduced by overwhelming failure. <laughs> um, everybody talks about the fact that um, uh, Deaths of Despair points out for the first time white people's deaths and lifespans have decreased. But that's not exactly true. It's people with only a high school degree's lifespans have decreased. And we see that same inner city function. Uh, so Car uh, Carl has a concept. He calls it entitlement. He, which uh, didn't come out very well uh, in his interview with Kasha. Entitlement is the view of middle-class drug users that the drugs that they prefer, psychedelics and marijuana, are good, and the drugs that people in inner cities, meth, cocaine, and heroin, are bad. He could have said something more radical, and I'll say it here because we're getting towards the end. The reason that America's approach to drugs doesn't change, and which deaths by, of, by despair, deaths of despair, adumbrates is, the, the main dysfunctions and disbenefits of our thinking about addiction fall on people without privileges or resources. And one of the reasons, strangely enough for that is, although, privileged people, upper middle class people, endorse the disease theory, they sort of don't believe it. For example, uh, uh, there have been a million television programs about, you know, series about explaining the drug crisis. Um, 
what was that number one bestseller on Netflix? Maybe somebody can remind me. And they interviewed the guy who produced it. And uh, I watched it on um, um, the leading liberal program. And he said, over half of the people who take a painkiller will become addicted, which is preposterous. And every moderator, every moderator on Morning Joe agreed with it. And I happen to remember that um, uh, Mika Brzezinski described her daughter having an athletic injury. And she said, well, we're, she's taking, you know, Oxycontin or some such drug. But we're very aware of it and we're teaching her to be very aware. Upper middle class people understand mindfulness and the need to take possession of your drug experiences. They'll fund Nora Volko until the cows come in, but their lives already more closely resemble the kind of model that Bruce espouses, which is being in an integrated family community with resources that allows them to understand that they're in control of their drug experience. And so the simple answer is to how long will they let Nora Volko be head of the NIDA as drug deaths continue to multiply beyond belief? Is there some point? Okay, I'm gonna stop you there. Stop, stop, will, stop, they, will they take her job away? Sandra, and sort of the, answer to that, the answer to that question is, Oh gosh, when it starts affecting middle class people, then then geez, we might need to get somebody in there. Okay, I can imagine that Lee's got a, a suitably fitting follow on question. So over to Lee, please. Please keep it succinct that we can finish on time. Thank yeah, thanks, Dan. And that was a fascinating talk. Um, I was particularly interested in your inverse correlation between consumption and problem, and it relates to what you were saying about um, social gradients. Uh, the, the one example, and I've been doing a bit of work on the harm paradox in, in the low socioeconomic groups. They drink less, but they've got more problems. And That and correlation is always found. Uh, people with high school degrees are less likely to drink and more likely to have drinking problems. Exactly mm -hmm. so. With high or without? Without uh, well, it's a correlate, you know, fewer drink of those who drink a far higher percentage have problems, but overall they have more problems. Sense of despair is about poor people. But why does it manifest? This is what I can't understand is how to interpret the harm paradox is, is being poor obviously is going to do you a disservice. Drinking on top of that is going to sort of add to it, even if you drink less. But, but why does it? manifest particularly in, in alcohol dependence scores being higher and alcohol related deaths. Well, that's, other types of deaths. that's a little bit of, I mean, Carl Hart does not have a theory of addiction. Carl Hart talks about drug problems as a gloss. And I'm making that same thing right now. They have more alcohol problems they have more alcohol dependence, they have more alcohol deaths, which the, the study I referred to, Alcohol and Post-War Europe, found. They had both more social problems and more deaths. They go together, so I'm lumping them together. Uh, obviously, somebody would say, well, obviously not all the people who are dying due to drugs are dying because they're addicted. You know, it's some misuse of drugs in a lethal fashion that's causing you to death. Did I get to where you were going? I think so, but I mean, the, the recent papers I've seen on the harm paradox is they say there's 51 possible explanations. Uh, that's what they've uh, tabulated. And I, uh, I was hoping you would uh, cut through all of that and just tell me uh, why it occurs. <laughs> well, death of despair is about four sources of death, alcohol, drugs, suicide and there's greater violence in those communities. So you might say, well, wait a second, suicide and now you're talking about suicide and alcohol problems, they put it in the same pot. And the reason they do so is because all of them are at an elevated level among certain identifiable populations. We're back to Carl's. Addiction, drugs are not the problem. Um, Another way of putting that is when you hear of a death, a drug death or other related death, 
Don't ask about the drug, ask about the person and ask about the culture and the community in which they reside. Thank you very much. Um, we've got who, who'd like to pose the next question or, or, or raise a discussion point. We've got we, we'll, we'll carry on until about five past, so we've got plenty. We've got a little bit more time for, for any questions. Well, um, normally. People, I'll give you a question to people. I do an exercise. Where I go to a group of people, they're generally middle class people because, you know, they're counselors. And I ask them two questions. I say, what's the toughest addiction to quit? And they all shout out tobacco. And then I say, oh, wow, that's amazing. Has anybody in this room quit smoking? And if it's a group of people who came up in the normal pattern of uh, treatment professionals, more than half the room will raise their hand. And then I'll say, fabulous, that's unbelievable. By the way, how many of you joined a support group or used a pharmaceutical to quit smoking? And often, if 500 people raise their hand, nobody will raise their hand. And I said, oh, you guys are too radical for me. You are people who subscribe to the disease model of alcoholism. You've just told me that a majority of people in this room have quit the toughest addiction of all to quit. And you did it without any explicit external assistance. And then I say, well, why did you quit, by the way? And a couple of people raised their hand and they say, well, I had a child. What a stupid reason. By the way, I have something called the Light Process Program, and the program is geared towards allowing people to enhance their community, their professional standing, um, all of those uh, resources that take people out of uh, the deaths of despair category. And then I'll tell you my last experiment can, can I, that I do. On. So, so, actually, Sam, if, if no one else wants to ask a question, may I ask a question? Bless your little heart, Derek, of course. But, but thank you. So so I, I agree with a lot of what you said, but I suppose the question that springs to mind, why are you sort of strung up or hung up on, on addiction if you actually think it's you know what value does the concept of you know you criticize the conceptualization of addiction and everything but what value does the concept of addiction add do you think Thank does, you for it, that not, actually, does it not undermine people's age sense of agency thank you for that question i have something called the light process program we not only don't tell people they have a disease we don't tell people they have an addiction and people call up and say am i addicted and what we say is a motivational interviewing thing. Well, let me delay that question. What kinds of problems do you have? Why have you phoned into us? And we work backwards from that. And quite often it has some, as they understood, it has some relationship to alcohol. Very few people would resemble, certainly in a call-in service, uh, an online service like ours, what would be called addiction. Nonetheless, Everybody knows what you mean when you say addiction. Everybody understands where you're getting at. I was on the board of something called Above and Beyond, which was an inner city addiction treatment group. Homeless people are often, heroin was their big problem. And I would do a little panel with them. And I would say, has any of you ever been addicted to a love relationship? And you might, Everybody in the room knows what I mean. Every do you know what I mean? Yes, but but just because people know it, I mean, when when people use concepts, they also sort of buy into the associations of that concept, and for all the wrong reasons, powerlessness seems to be associated with addiction. So I don't know whether it's helpful, but I'll pass on to Bruce. To, to well, his, it's a definition of addiction. We're talking about the definition of addiction. Now, I gave you my definition. It's an experience that creates the struggle, that fills needed necessary needs, but has overall compulsive and destructive consequences 
but is not in the critical issue is if it's permanent or inbred. That's the critical issue. The fact that people under if you look at my um, uh, Wikimedia, uh, Wikipedia entry, it says Stan Beal feels that addiction is something that people in general outgrow that every human being can touch base with the addiction experience. Everybody here knows what it's like to be out of control of an experience, often perhaps in a relationship, where you're drawn to something uh, and the more you get involved in it, the deeper you're attached to the more it's destructive it is. It's important that we all understand that addiction is a fundamental human motivation. It's not related to drugs. It's not an exceptional medical thing. By the way, uh, has anybody been watching the Heard uh, Johnny Depp trial? It's had a couple of negative consequences. He cut off his finger during one fight. It's ruined both of their careers. He's now in court suing her for $40 million. She's countersuing him for 100 whatever. And their whole lives are being broadcast on television. Which is, and her testimony is, I knew almost from the start that this was a bad relationship for me, but I couldn't leave it. And I, uh, I have a blog on that of my um, um, life process program. Um, love addiction is the hardest addiction to quit. It's important to identify a syndrome that people experience to let them know it's a, letting them know it's a normal human experience, in my mind, makes it easier for them to get beyond it. Letting them know it's something that most people undergo, but outgrow. Most people don't have the kind of destructive relationships in their 20s that they had in their 20s when they get to be 50 or 60. Uh, giving the essential humanity of addiction is, is, a, is a gift to people. Well, I'm not going to tell you you're addicted. Uh, you tell me what your problems are, but I am going to tell you whether, however you view what your problem is, and you might call it an addiction, it's not a disease, it's not lifelong, it's not uncontrollable, it's a part of everybody's ordinary human experience that can be remedied by your ability to interact and create a whole life outside of that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Bruce, very quickly. Quick question, Stanton, to, so that we can end. Um, what would you consider, you having defined addiction very carefully, what's what's the most important and most dangerous addiction for society? That's the question you open your thing with. Um, yes, right. The, 20, the 2019 Happiness Report identifies the answer to that question. But, but you tell it's us. The same one that, it's the same one that you give. Um, by the way, uh, when you, I don't know if any of you were in the Nobel Prize Committee, but um, um, DSM-5 for the first time identifies non-drug problems as addiction. And they oh. identify one thing in the universe, gambling. Uh, ISD-11 identifies two addiction-like things sex and gaming and the 2019 happiness report uh, there's been a tremendous decline there's been a tremendous increase in depression among young people it identifies based on the work of a researcher people's in mesh being enmeshed in games they're ever present they detract people from people's abilities to have real related even to go outdoors they have the most destructive, the guy who killed all those kids in Newtown spent all night playing video games. It has the worst extreme final examples. It's pervasive. And I, you actually, I think, mentioned it. People are beginning to think that we're having gaming, uh, gaming and electronic device addictions are actually, they say this, changing our very way of being a human being. What happens when a whole population is defined by its primary addiction? I guess we'll have to read I guess they'll have to remove gaming as an addiction and make it a normal thing. Okay, 
Thank you very, very much, Stanton, for a really brilliant talk. And for um, I'm going to stop recording now, and I hope to see you all in virtual Helsinki next month again. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank Thanks you so much to all of you, Dirk. Write me if you want my uh, 